Okay, I'll uh, finish what we started last time. Uh, let me just uh, give a brief uh, remark over the definition of the order essential. Uh, order essential edges. Uh, you remember uh, there was uh, you have an infinite graph. Y in general, we are interested in infinite graphs, like y hat. And an edge is uh, called order essential if uh, th there is a path. So we assume there is an ordering on the edges uh, of this graph. So with the, with the ordering. Uh, an edge is order essential if there is a path consisting of smaller edges um, connecting the two endpoints. Or uh, there is a uh, there is a uh, the union. So either there is a finite vein or there is an infinite vein like this. Uh, let me say so there is a one can define so for for any subset of edges in y hat one can define the relative graph. So let uh, the relative. Uh, graph. Uh, the notation is y hat uh, with respect to e. And what it is, you just take all the vertices of y hat and uh, take the disjoint union with the edges, not all the edges, but just the edges in e. So in other words, th this graph is obtained by removing all the edges which are not in this set. So you start with y hat and then remove uh, all the edges which are not in e. Um, so it's a real relative graph. Then we can take uh, this E as an example. So take uh, this E to be the set of all edges in Y hat that are smaller than sigma. Right? Uh, then uh, this path, so this is what this blue is. So uh, on the picture this is blue. It, um, in this case, so this, it means that this path uh, is a path in the relative graph uh, relative to the set of edges that are smaller um, and this um, infinite vein as well so having such a path it's equivalent to saying that there is a um, uh, you take the component of the relative graph which contains uh, this um, left endpoint and then you take the component of the relative graph that contains the right endpoint uh, having such a path is equivalent to saying that those components coincide. It's, it's the same, uh, the same component. So um, uh, one can equivalently restate uh, this uh, uh, by saying that uh, the, the components, so sigma uh, is order essential um, if and only if uh, this, this is an equivalent definition of being order essential if the components Uh, components of the uh, relative um, relative graph uh, y hat well, essential maybe I should say in y hat uh, of the relative graph uh, graph y hat with respect to this e this e here if the relative uh, if the components of this relative graphs graph containing Containing, uh, let me call it sigma minus and sigma plus. So that just means uh, this is our sigma. Uh, sigma minus is this vertex. Uh, it's an oriented edge. So sigma minus is the first um, the point of this edge, and sigma plus is the second point. If uh, so, what's an equivalent? Um, an equivalent uh, statement for this would be that the components, uh, these two components, corresponding to this point and corresponding to this point, they coincide. Um, coincide. Or, or this case. Um, in this case, um, having an infinite ray like this um, uh, in the component, that means that the component must be infinite. And the same thing uh, should uh, hold for this. Coincide or are both infinite. 
both infinite. So if one of these conditions hold it, uh, that's equivalent to saying that uh, sigma is order essential. So the, the picture would be like this. There is a component here, and uh, there is a component. Uh, they might coincide, but the point is uh, they, they must be infinite in this case. Uh, we wanted to show, uh, going back to, the, to finishing the proof of the Hannah Neumann conjecture, uh, we took uh, we took a system of uh, of graphs. This is part of that system, and we considered the set of all other essential edges in Y hat, other essential edges in Z hat, and other essential edges in S hat. Uh, then we took quotients of those, and uh, our goal is to, uh, this is the quotient of this set, this is the quotient of this set by the group action, and this is the quotient of, uh, of this set. Um, uh, we wanted to show that the, and then we checked that the cardinality of this set is at most the cardinality of this times the cardinality of this. We did it by including by uh, showing that the system of complexes gives an inclusion of this finite set into the Cartesian product of these two. Uh, we only are left with showing that uh, the reduced trunk of EY is the same um, as the, the cardinality, uh, sorry, uh, the reduced trunk of Y is the same thing as the cardinality of the um, set, the quotient set of those other essential so, um, edges that we uh, we picked. In order to show this, we wanted to check that this set um, is a choice of a maximal essential set in the graph Y. If that's the case, then this equality holds. And in order to check that it's maximal essential, we need to show that it's essential first, and then to check that it's maximal. We showed that, uh, we did show last time that uh, this set of edges is essential in, in Y. We did it by showing that uh, we use the deep fall property. So first we show the deep fall property for this action. So use the deep uh, fall property. Uh, property for uh, for the action of gamma on y hat. Uh, the deep fall property implied uh, that this set is in uh, is essential. Uh, we showed it by uh, just removing one edge at a time and showing that the reduced trunk uh, of y must decrease uh, exactly by one every time. So it only remains to show that this set is maximal. Have you already shown that they are non-empty? Uh, who? E y hat. E y hat. No, I didn't. It, they might be empty. If uh, z, if if z happens to be a circle, say, a flower, uh, then um, uh, there wouldn't be any. They're still maximal. Uh, the empty set is still maximal. Uh, I mean, it's the empty set. But it, it's still, it, it will be maximal. There is nothing else to remove. So to show, uh, to show that this set is actually maximal, is maximal. Uh, maximal essential set in, in the finite graph Y. Uh, so remember that maximality means that we cannot decrease the reduced rank anymore by removing edges. So by E, we need to show that the reduced trunk of Y minus, minus uh, this set, the reduced trunk of the result is 0. So that's equivalent to saying that after you remove this, this becomes a garden. Uh, OK, so how do we uh, check this? Uh, we argue by contradiction. So suppose. Uh, 
maybe I should state explicitly a general uh, general statement. So let, uh, let's say lemma. Let uh, y, y hat. So in order to distinguish it from that y hat, maybe let me put double prime here. So uh, y hat be a, a b um, have a free uh, core compact core compact and just to make sure the ordered so action uh, gamma action um, and preserving an order so y double prime hat is ordered uh, and uh, by which I mean the set of edges of this uh, graph is has an ordering has a total ordering and and the gamma action preserves let's see yeah Pre preserves the the ordering the order uh, if it's the case um, so if um, y double prime has no other essential um, edges edges then then I want to conclude what we want to conclude um, we take the quotient of this graph then the quotient the reduced trunk of the quotient of y double prime hat uh, must be zero. So it means that if we already removed, uh, think of uh, starting with y hat, and then we remove all the other essential edges. So uh, what is um, what is left? All the edges are other inessential in this infinite graph uh, y hat. If that's the case, then uh, this lemma says that if you take the quotient. Then in the quotient, the reduced rank is zero. Uh, this is exactly what we want. So this uh, y hat double prime is, of course, I'm going to take it to be what? To be y hat minus all other essential edges. Uh, this is how we apply this lemma. But let's prove the lemma. So you only assume it's a graph, y hat two prime in the lemma. Uh, it's a graph, yeah. It, it's only a graph. Um, because uh, just for a simple reason, because uh, this reduced rank is defined only for graphs. Okay. No other so the proof. Uh, we argue by contradiction. So it should be clear how this lemma implies what we want. Right. Uh, we take y double prime to be y, y hat double prime to be y hat minus all other essential edges. Then, yeah, maybe I should. Uh, one more thing, maybe I should be more explicit here. So uh, it's not only this, but also uh, y hat double prime is a tree. Then let me state it more precisely. Is is a forest? Is a forest? It means a union of trees, disjoint union of trees. A forest and uh, the reduced trunk of of the quotient. Uh, is zero. So any uh, any graph like this, um, whose edges are ordered and which has um, gamma action, uh, uh, if all other if all edges are order inessential, uh, then uh, it must be a forest. Uh, first of all. So the proof. So suppose. Uh, suppose y hat double prime is not a forest. Uh, that would mean that it has a loop, at least one loop, non-trivial. Then uh, there is a loop uh, in in y hat double prime. Since there is a loop, it's a finite path. 
and we consider the set of edges of this loop it's a finite set and we have an ordering we use the ordering on the edges of this graph since this is the finite set we can pick the maximal possible loop in here the maximal possible edge in this loop so say say this w is the maximal there is a maximal uh, edge uh, among all the edges, uh, we are talking about the finite set here. Of course, uh, if it would, uh, if it was infinite, uh, we wouldn't be able to find, might not be able to find the maximal. But since it's a finite graph, there is a maximal edge omega here. But that uh, that exactly means that this omega has a vein, because all the other edges are smaller than uh, omega. Uh, since there is a vein, it means that omega is order essential. And that gives a contradiction. Is order essential? And uh, this uh, contradiction uh, contradicts th this contradicts our assumption that all edges are not order essential, are order inessential. Okay, so uh, y double prime hat must be a tree. Uh, similarly, we prove this by contradiction. So suppose, or, or rather, we could do it directly also. So consider this quotient. Is a finite graph. That's our assumption. It's core compact. Uh, it's a finite graph. It doesn't have to be connected. So we just pick some component. So pick a component uh, of this quotient. Or actually, pick a component of any component of y, y hat double prime. And let, so denote it, denote it y hat prime. Just one component of this. And then we take the stabilizer of this component. Stabilizer in gamma of y hat prime. Uh, what can we say about the quotient of gamma, um, of, gamma uh, of y hat prime by gamma prime? Uh, how does it relate to this? So we have a, um, a forest now. And the group gamma uh, acts on this, permuting, it permutes the components of this forest. Uh, we took just one component here. And then we took the quotient of that component by its stabilizer. Uh, what's the result? The result would be a component of this quotient is a component of the uh, quotient by gamma of the whole graph. Right. Uh, what is our goal? Our goal is to show that this quotient has reduced rank zero. This is equivalent to showing that all possible such, uh, you take all possible components y prime in, uh, in y double prime. Uh, uh, yeah, it is a component of this graph. Well, when it's pointing the y hat prime is connected with they cannot be. If it's a different component, they cannot be. Con two different components cannot be connected by a path. Even by the gamma action. Uh, by a gamma action, but not by a path. Yeah. But I'm taking only. I'm not taking the whole group. I'm only taking the stabilizer of this component. Uh, yeah. Two different components would be connected. And for the different component, the quotient of that component by the stabilizer would be the same thing. I, I guess I'm not sure exactly what what is the question. There might be a for there is a forest by the prime, and 
Yeah, they can be, but not uh, they, uh, they they will be identified by gamma, but not by gamma prime. Can you claim that it is really a component of the? Yeah, it is really a component. Um, they uh, two different components cannot be identified by some element of gamma prime because if they are, then they must be the same. So I think the second blackboard is true for any graph y had two prime and any group action gamma, forgetting all the other conditions. Yeah, uh, just uh, it's a very general statement. Uh, you think of the action of gamma on the set of components of of y had double prime. Or even topological space. Yeah. The stabilizer of each of them, uh, just by the definition of the stabilizer, it means that it cannot map this component to another one. That's what stabilizer means. The stabilizer consists of all the elements which preserve this given component. It cannot map this component to another one. So this is a component. And, uh, so this is a finite graph also. We want to show that the reduced rank of this is zero. Uh, this is equivalent since the reduced rank is additive under the disjoint union. You remember, the definition of the uh, reduced rank was that we, we picked components and then we took the sum over all components in, in a graph. So it's additive under taking disjoint unions. So in order to show that this reduced rank is zero, it's equivalent to showing that this reduced rank is zero. The reduced rank of this graph is zero for all possible cho choices of component y. Uh, but this is now connected, right? This is connected. Uh, in other words, what we want to show, uh, we want to show that this graph is a uh, tree or a uh, flower. Um, that's the goal. So suppose we argue by contradiction. Suppose that the reduced trunk of this quotient um, is not is strictly bigger than zero, and this is a connected graph. So it's not a tree and it's not a flower. So this graph m uh, must be at least of this type. It must have at least uh, at least two loops in it. Um, then we take the. Um, so we have this map to the quotient. We consider this quotient map. Uh, uh, now, each component of y hat double prime was a tree. We just proved it. Uh, y hat double prime is a forest. Each component is a tree. So this component is a tree. And we took a quotient of this tree by <coughs> the gamma prime action. By the, uh, and this action is free. Uh, the stabilizers of this action are trivial. So we took a quotient of a tree by a free action of some group. Uh, then this implies that uh, then gamma prime is exactly the fundamental group of this. By one of gamma prime y hat. So in other words, gamma prime is a free group. So gamma prime is a free group. Uh, if it's free, and moreover, the graph should look like this, or, or, or the rank should be even bigger. Uh, what can we say about the rank of this free group? It should be at least two, the usual rank. then the rank of gamma prime is at least two. So we can uh, pick a basis of, of this free group. You remember, choosing a basis corresponds to picking some um, maximal subtree in this connected graph. And then how many edges are left, uh, that's the rank. Uh, so uh, pick, pick a basis uh, for, for gamma prime. This basis consists, uh, contains at least two elements. So let uh, G and H uh, be uh, uh, some elements, 
some elements uh, of this basis. Uh, so gamma prime acts on y hat prime once again, right? This is a tree. We have a, a action by three group uh, on uh, on this tree, and we picked some elements g and h uh, in gamma prime. Uh, those are non-trivial elements because they are part of some basis. Um, for all non-trivial elements of a free group acting on a tree, uh, there is always an axis. It means that uh, consider the axis of G and H in the component Y hat prime. Uh, what are the axes? So an axis for G, uh, it's a line. It's a bi-infinite um, geodesic, if you like. It's a bi-infinite path, which is preserved by the action of G. So if you, uh, l let's call this L sub G. It's a line. It's a sequence of edges, uh, infinite in both directions, uh, I with the property that it's preserved under, the, uh, under G. So L sub G. If you apply G to that, uh, that is again L sub G. And uh, the way it acts, it just translates. So it's a, it's a little exercise to check that such an axis always exists. The way you prove this, you start with any point. Maybe I should indicate how you, you prove this quickly. Uh, so you start with any base point, say, x, x naught, or any other point. Um, and then consider um, g of x naught. Then consider g square of x naught. Uh, and so on, and G inverse as well, in the opposite direction. And each of them you connect, uh, connect by a path. Um, if, if this path uh, does not intersect this previous path, uh, then we are done. They form an, a line, but it's not always the case. It might happen that uh, this path and this path, they overlap for some time and then they diverge. Um, so this path is the path connecting x naught to g x naught. Uh, this path is connecting uh, g inverse g inverse x naught to x naught. It might happen that they overlap like this in a tree, and then the picture repeats, uh, and so on. So, what is the line which is invariant under the group action? You just remove these parts. This uh, this is the line. Uh, this is the axis of g. That's the explicit construction of the, of the axis. So uh, this is what I'm taking here. This is L sub G. Um, simil similarly, I can take the axis for H. This is L sub H, which is also invariant under the element. And they are disjoint. Uh, I mean, not disjoint, they might intersect, but uh, I mean, mostly they are disjoint. Uh, most of the time, they, they go to different um, kind of points at infinity. Um, okay, and uh, what is the action? As you can see on this picture, our line is subdivided into subintervals, and the uh, the group action, uh, the G action, just translates. It maps this interval to this uh, to the next interval. So G square would map it twice, uh, G cube three times, and so on. It just translates the line by uh, shifting all the intervals. So this line is subdivided into intervals. Uh, let's call this interval P. P is uh, one of those intervals on, on one P. Similarly for H, H is subdivided into intervals and one of those intervals we might call Q. This P is a finite path and we play the same trick. Now we recall, as we did for loops here, that P is a finite path. It has finitely many edges. So let let Xi be uh, the maximal uh, edge in, in the past P. So Xi is right here somewhere. Uh, similarly, I can pick some edge, uh, let's call it eta. Uh, eta is the maximal edge on Q. 
and eta uh, maximal um, edge on Q. Maximal with respect to the ordering that we have on the edges. Uh, so this psi here is the maximal among uh, this finite set of edges. This eta is maximal among uh, this set of edges. And now, uh, what if I apply g to psi? So g acts on this line, uh, apply this element g. Uh, say, say right here, this is g psi. This is g p. g p. The shift of p by, by the element. Um, and we can continue shifting, right? The next would be g square psi, g cube psi, and so on. Uh, what can we say about g psi? g psi, uh, I claim that um, it's maximal among all the edges on, on this path. Why is this? Because psi is maximal among all the edges uh, in P. But the ordering is invariant under the group action. Uh, this implies that uh, g psi is the maximal among And for any i, uh, g i psi is maximal uh, among um, the among the edges uh, in g i p. So you translate uh, because uh, because the ordering is invariant under the group action. Uh, this is what I'm using. So consider the case. We only need to check, like consider the case. If I take xi and g xi, which one of them is bigger? So there are two cases to consider. So let's say, uh, let's say g xi is smaller than xi. Then what can we deduce? Um, uh, this edge is smaller than this edge. But this edge, g xi, is the largest among all the edges in here. So that means that all the edges, both in this path and in this path, are all smaller than xi. Uh, similarly, you can do g square. You take the next path, the next path, the next path. Well, all of them, for all numbers i. Um, all of them will have the property that all the edges on those paths will be smaller than psi. So any any edge uh, on any on any g i p for uh, for i at least zero uh, will be will be. Uh, not larger, bounded above, uh, smaller. Maybe I should say uh, strict inequality here. But then it will be strictly smaller than, than psi. So it means that uh, the edges on this, uh, this whole ray that goes down here, uh, all the edges on this ray will be smaller than psi. Similarly, we can consider the case I can add here another condition. I consider the case when h eta is strictly less than eta. Uh, exactly in the same way, we show that uh, the whole ray of edges that are smaller than, uh, than eta, all those edges will be smaller than eta. And then we connect. We can connect, uh, take a path connecting psi and eta. Uh, th those two paths, they might not overlap, maybe, or they might, we don't know. But uh, in any case, we consider a path. It's a finite path. Uh, on this path, so connect uh, xi and eta uh, by some finite path. And on this finite path, we can choose um, the maximal edge because it's a finite path. Let uh, omega be 
the maximal. And by connecting by a path, I mean, uh, there might be some overlap between this ray here and this path, then I remove the overlap. So uh, I guess the idea is that I'm taking this P here sufficiently far down, and I'm taking this Q here also sufficiently far down, so these two rays are completely disjoint. And then uh, we connect them by a pass. Uh, this is a finite pass. Uh, let omega be the maximal edge in this, in this path. Uh, then what do we get? Omega is somewhere here. Uh, omega is bigger than any edge on this path, including, including psi, in including eta. I'm including them in a path. Uh, and, but psi is bigger than any edge below here, and eta is um, bigger than any edge below here. It means that uh, omega is bigger than any other edge on this line. Uh, but this line is, uh, take this line and remove omega. What is left is an infinite vein. So then omega has an infinite vein. vein consisting of smaller edges. Uh, that implies that what? Uh, it implies that uh, omega uh, is order essential. But our assumption at the beginning was that uh, there are no other essential edges in a graph. All other essential, uh, all edges were other inessential. This gives a contradiction. Uh, this contradiction shows once again. So uh, how did we obtain this contradiction? We got it from the assumption, uh, from this assumption. We assumed that the rank was. We assume that the rank was of this type. Uh, we suppose that the, um, the graph was not a tree and it was not a flower, the com this quotient of the component. Um, and uh, we obtain a contradiction. Uh, that means that uh, this graph um, that we obtain by quotient, uh, quotient uh, must be a tree or a flower. That implies that every single component of, of um, of this graph, gamma y double prime. Um, this implies that every component of this finite graph must be a tree or a flower. That implies that the reduced trunk of this is zero. Uh, this graph is a, is a garden. Uh, the reduced trunk of this uh, graph must be zero. Uh, that proves maximality. Uh, and you will see uh, when we will talk about um, um, L2 Betty numbers, uh, we will see an uh, analytic argument for, for this maximality. Well, th there is a way to, to prove this analytically. So what was P there? Uh, P was a period. Uh, it's a period of G. G acts kind of periodically. It's, it's one pass, uh, then GP is, uh, is the shift of P. P is the fundamental domain for the G action on this line. Uh, it's the interval uh, such that this whole line is obtained by shifting g, uh, shifting uh, p by g. It's the fundamental domain for the action of g on, on, on the line. Omega might be psi or eta, right? It might be, yeah. Uh, of course, yeah. That's one. Uh, not always. I mean, the point is that this edge, I mean, it can be subdivided in many edges here. If you take the universal covering of this graph, uh, it would be, it's not just one edge here. You can always subdivide and make it two. Yeah. Uh, so this proves the uh, the conjecture, and uh, there is a more general uh, statement. 
there is a uh, more general um, or rather maybe I should say uh, um, I kind of was cheating right so what, uh, what did we actually prove so we proved uh, we proved the following we proved that the reduced rank of s is at most the reduced rank of y times the reduced rank of of z right this is what we showed uh, this is not exactly the statement of the original uh, Hanno Neumann conjecture, right? The statement of the original Hanno Neumann conjecture was the sum over, uh, over u in S of double cosets of the uh, a to the power u intersection b should be at most the reduced rank of a times the reduced rank of b, right? So I kind of stated without proof that this is e equivalent to this, right? So let me give you an idea why this is actually equivalent. Uh, and this is certainly a better way of thinking of the conjecture. But since this was the original algebraic statement, we better make sure that that's the same thing. Uh, so again, this should hold for this situation. When you have a fiber product of finite graphs, like this, at the end this um, sh should hold. Uh, the proof, uh, let me just write one equality and uh, let me just uh, indicate uh, how you show this. The reduced rank of S, so I want to start uh, we want to show that uh, th uh, this left hand side is equal to this left hand side. Showing that this part is equal to this part is reasonably easy. Uh, why is this? Because A is a stabilizer uh, of some uh, component of Y hat. So A acts on this, what we called cursive A. Right, and this is what um, this was a component in in y hat. Um, but what is this component? Uh, this component is a tree. We we talk about graphs here, and we took universal covers. Uh, those are leafages. So any subgraph of a connected subgraph of a tree is again a tree. Uh, so this is a tree, and we have a free action on a tree. Uh, then what's the reduced rank of y? And but the quotient of gamma, uh, the quotient of y hat uh, by the group gamma is the same thing as the quotient of just this component by the stabilizer. Right? Because there is only one. Y you remember y was a connected graph. There is just one component here. Uh, so gamma acts on this. It permutes components, but it permutes them transitively. Every component can be mapped by any other component, uh, by the gamma action. Uh, so the quotient of this is the same as the quotient of this. Uh, but uh, what is uh, the quotient? So we have a free action of some group A on A3. Uh, that means that you, you just check in this case that uh, the reduced rank of... Uh, wh what did we call the reduced rank of a group? Uh, it's the um, like uh, maximum between two numbers, zero and uh, usual rank minus one. You check that that number that we define for a group uh, is the same thing as the number that you obtain uh, uh, from the graph. Uh, that's um, a little exercise to, to check, but that should be really uh, reasonably uh, clear. There is only one component in this graph, uh, and that component exactly corresponds to this group. Okay. So uh, this should be clear. The equality of this with this is uh, sh should be clear. Uh, that's the, uh, we just relate the definition of the reduced rank for a group to the definition of the reduced rank for a connected graph. Uh, the same thing here, right? These two are also equal. So it remains to show that these two numbers are the same. So let's write this as a gamma b, uh, the reduced rank of a u intersection b. 
Uh, why is this the same? So we start with the left hand side and uh, write a series of equalities. So first of all, this is the reduced trunk. S is the quotient of uh, gamma by of S hat by gamma. Uh, now we recall what is S hat. Uh, S hat is the fiber product of Y hat and Z hat. And what are the components? Since Y hat and Z hat are both leafages over X, uh, over X hat, um, then the components of S hat corresponds to pairs. One component in Y hat, another component in Z hat. Uh, those, so the, this reduced trunk would be, it's the reduced trunk of uh, gamma, uh, quotient by gamma of what? Of the union of all those components, disjoint union. It's the disjoint union uh, over all components. Uh, what are those components? Those components are labeled by pairs of uh, one component in, X ha in Y hat, uh, another component uh, in Z hat. But those correspond to left cosets. Um, so, in other words, uh, these are labeled by pairs Y and Z, such that Y belongs to gamma over A, and Z belongs to gamma over B. Uh, those components are labeled by pairs of left cosets. Uh, and those components we denoted by S sub YZ, S hat. Right, so, uh, I, I'm just writing what S hat is. It's a disjoint union of its components. And now, uh, so the big question mark. Uh, this magically happens to be the same as the reduced trunk of the quotient by, uh, so the disjoint union overall, disjoint union over what we want. You remember, these were representatives of double cosets. So U is a representative of a double coset. U, S, A, gamma, B. Uh, for all those representatives, you, uh, you pick, you take the component, um, a very specific component. It's the S hat. Uh, I'm taking Z to be just the trivial left coset of B, just B itself. And I'm taking y uh, corresponding to u inverse. So it's s that corresponds to, the first uh, coordinate here is u inverse of a. It's the left coset of a, which is given by u inverse. Uh, and for z, I'm taking just 1 times b. So that means it's just b as a left coset in, uh, in gamma. And then uh, this is a component, and then we take the quotient of that by what? By the stabilizer of this component. Uh, what is the stabilizer of this component? In general, maybe I should write it uh, somewhere on the side. So before I continue this, uh, what is the. Uh, so I need to write here, right? I want to write the quotient of this by something by the stabilizer of this component. Uh, let's see what the stabilizer of S, uh, Y, Z is. The stabilizer over gamma. What is this component again? It's the intersection of the component in Y hat corresponding to Y. And the component in Z hat corresponding to Z. It's the intersection of two components. What is the stabilizer of the intersection? Um, in general, it's not true, but in this case, it's the same thing as the intersection of stabilizers. It's the stabilizer of gamma of the component in Y hat corresponding to Y, intersection with the stabilizer of the component uh, Z hat cor uh, corresponding to Z. Uh, and what are they? Uh, so this y is a left coset. You can actually, uh, if this y happens to be 1, uh, this would be the stabilizer of that particular component A that we picked. Um, but the stabilizer of that is just the group A. If we pick a different left coset, uh, what's the stabilizer of that other left coset? 
it would be a conjugate of A. Uh, conjugate with respect uh, by what? Conjugate by whatever describes that left coset. Uh, so, uh, what, I, what I want to say here, I want to write here the stabilizer of this component. But that's the same thing as the conjugate of A by this U, uh, intersected with the stabilizer of this left coset. That happens to be just B itself, intersection with B. So that's, it's kind of a complicated way, a little bit, of, of writing, but all I mean here is you take a component and uh, quotient it by the stabilizer of that component. And now we can uh, continue. This is equal to the reduced rank of what? Uh, disjoint union. Again, the disjoint union over U as, as before. Ah, actually, wait. It's not the union anymore. Uh, the reduced rank is additive, so we can take the sum over U in S, A, gamma, B. Um, the reduced rank of what? The reduced rank of this uh, graph. We took an infinite component, took the infinite or finite, we don't know. Yeah, but we took a quotient of that, and the quotient be uh, becomes finite. Um, this is again, this is a tree. We took a quotient of a tree by a group, which um, acts on this tree freely. Again, by the same argument as we showed here, uh, that these are two equal. The reduced rank of this quotient is the same thing as the reduced rank of that group, of this group that we uh, quotient by. Uh, intersection B. This is a free group. And that proves the statement, right? Provided we indeed know this equality. So it only remains to show uh, that this equality holds. So what does it, um, how can it, um, how can they be related? This equality, so this question mark here, in order to show it, uh, you check that, check that uh, the map, uh, we consider this index set and relate it to this index set. Uh, consider the map uh, theta uh, from from here, from S of A gamma B to uh, to the other index set uh, gamma over A cross gamma over B. Uh, there is an explicit map. I'm just going to give it. Uh, what it does, it it maps U. Uh, to uh, u to exactly this, uh, to the pair u inverse a and then 1, one b. This is the explicit map. And then you check, you check that uh, theta is injective. Uh, and uh, yeah, the way to think maybe, uh, think of the gamma action on this uh, Cartesian product. Gamma acts on here on the left. And gamma acts uh, on this term also on the left. So consider the diagonal action. Gamma acts on this Cartesian product. So gamma, gamma acts on the Cartesian product A, gamma B diagonally. So each element just uh, acts on this and on this simultaneously. Uh, and then you check that the image uh, the image of theta intersects uh, each orbit, each gamma orbit of this action exactly once. Uh, in other words, uh, what this map theta does, it picks a representative. So we have a gamma action on this Cartesian product. Uh, the image of theta, um, each element in the image, um, is a representative for a, an orbit, for a gamma orbit on this set. 
for the action on this set. Uh, so uh, representatives of double cosets, they get mapped to representatives of gamma orbits on here. G gamma orbits on here. <laughs> and that's, that's pretty much the, the proof of this. So the action um, of this set of components by the whole group uh, is the same as the disjoint union of the actions. Uh, we just pick one. Uh, this is a choice of one leaf. Uh, from the orbit of leaves. So, uh, as here we picked, theta picks a representative for a gamma orbit. Uh, that's equivalent to saying that uh, among all possible leaves, we just uh, consider an orbit of leaves and pick just one representative in each orbit. Uh, that's uh, this is what uh, what this does. We pick one representative, but then we need to take the quotient by its stabilizer. Right, so. Uh, the reason it's technical because the original statement was, you know, uh, uh, was technical, right? But uh, the right uh, topological way of thinking of the problem is this, and then uh, we can. S uh, this argument shows that uh, these two are equivalent, so that's the proof. Yeah. That uh, not be uh, It doesn't have to be surjective. Yes. It's not surjective. It picks one representative in each orbit. So orbit may be big, but we pick just one representative in each. Yeah, it's not uh, surjective. Uh, certainly, Mo most of the time it's not. Uh, okay, that proves uh, proves the conjecture. Uh, now, one would like to generalize the statement at least. First, hopefully, generalize the statement of the conjecture, and then. Uh, hopefully, maybe to, uh, to to prove some partial results, uh, some more general results. Uh, so there is a is a more general uh, statement. Uh, for we can uh, we don't have to assume that the gamma action on y hat uh, is um, is free. Actually, it suffices to assume that this action is free on edges only, and one can similarly deduce uh, results. So, a general statement uh, for uh, for uh, gamma actions. Uh, that are free, free only on uh, edges. So we don't really need to assume that the action is free on uh, vertices, uh, not necessarily. And you you can see at the end of that uh, that paper you can see a, a explicit uh, statement uh, in this regard. So there is a more general statement. Uh, this is why I want. Yeah, another generalization would be to consider not just trees, but uh, not forests, but uh, general graphs, yeah. only on edges, and and without assuming assuming that uh, that say y hat, z hat, s hat are uh, forests. So they can be arbitrary graphs, but with a free action by a group. We only need the fact that the group is left orderable, and it acts freely on some graph. Uh, one can still deduce um, uh, statements. Uh, one cannot state it in terms of the reduced trunk. The, this condition, I mean, the reduced trunk corresponds to the action of a group um, on a forest. Uh, but uh, one can give a more general statement if you talk not about the reduced trunk, but just the number of other essential edges for that action. Then similar inequality can be deduced. And then you can relax the condition from, uh, from the free action. You can relax it to, say, action which is free only on, on edges. Uh, one should also be able to uh, 
uh, to do this even if it's not free on edges but almost free say if the stabilizers of the group action on edges the edge stabilizers are for example finite uh, one should also get some reasonable uh, estimate uh, estimates similar to the statement of the Hanna Neumann conjecture uh, but this is all about graphs, right? Uh, the next step of generalization would be uh, to consider uh, complexes rather than graphs. So the next step, step consider uh, complexes. Uh, we can draw a system of complexes as we did before. We did it for graphs and I indicated how you do it for general complexes, uh, cell complexes in general. So again, let me draw this y x s hat x hat y hat z hat. So we have a system, we can construct a system of complexes. Uh, start with any complex X, uh, pick some immersion of Y into X and Z into X. By immersion we mean a, a map that can be completed to a covering. And then you take uh, any free, uh, any complex X hat with a group, with a free action by a group, uh, so that the quotient is X. It could be, for example, the universal covering of X. Uh, or more generally, just any uh, complex whose quotient by some group action uh, is X. Uh, one would like to first state a question, uh, to, to raise a question. What kind of question would generalize the statement of the Hanna Neumann conjecture? In the statement we had uh, the notion of uh, rank of groups, or equivalently we can restate it in terms of the reduced rank of a free group. Uh, when you go to complexes, there is no notion of rank for, like, if you take the fundamental group of X, for example, there is no reasonable notion of, of rank, uh, at least not on the surface of it. So I claim that there is some notion that actually mimics this. And this notion is the L2 Betty number for a group action. Uh, it turns out that uh, the reduced rank can be expressed in terms of L2 Betty numbers. And that brings us to the realm of analysis and Hilbert spaces. And that's what I would like to start next, unless you have any questions so far. So we'll talk about Hilbert spaces. Raise your, raise your hand if you know what it is. Yeah, I, I will be concerned only with a very special case of a Hilbert space. You don't really need to know the whole, the general theory of it. So we start with a group. Gamma is a group. And later on we will assume that the group is left orderable, but so far the um, discussion is all very general. Any group. Uh, and consider L2 of gamma. Uh, this is our uh, important example. L2 of gamma is the set of all functions uh, from gamma to, uh, l let's use complex numbers, or one can take real numbers here, to complex numbers such that the L2, L2 norm of f uh, is finite, where L2 norm of f uh, is defined to be the sum, so the L2 norm is defined you take the sum over all elements of the group the, the absolute value of the value on G and then square uh, so this space of functions on the group gamma to the complex numbers uh, it's a vector space and it has a norm uh, defined in this way it's the sum of squares of the absolute values Uh, it has the important 
uh, structure, uh, namely uh, orthogonality. For two functions like this, you have a question. Is it to be discrete? Uh, yeah, yeah. I assume it to be discrete, but uh, it doesn't. Uh, yeah, the short answer is yes. Uh, I assume, and for all our purposes, I'm working only with discrete groups. But, but even if it's not, one can still, you know, there is a, there are ways to put a Hilbert structure. Uh, still, uh, still, it's L2 of something. Uh, I mean, I even in a non-discrete case, you can think of this being, uh, uh, being of this type. So it, it doesn't really matter, but yeah, uh, we will talk only about discrete groups. Uh, what's important is that you can measure the angle, right? It's a natural generalization of Rn. Rn with the, uh, with the dot product, or the inner product, right? Given two vectors in Rn, you can uh, take the, the inner product of two, two vectors. Right? A1, An dot b1 bn so what's the inner product it's uh, a1 if you work with complex numbers you need to take the uh, conjugate b1 plus uh, a n b n right uh, that's the standard dot product in in rn uh, you can immediately generalize it to functions you you, you think of the sequence being a uh, function from the set one to n to to this uh, to the space uh, to I mean uh, to uh, to the complex numbers. So each such n tuple corresponds to a function from the set of n elements to complex numbers. The, and two such functions you multiply just you take the coordinates. You you take the uh, a one is the value of this function at the first point. B b one is the value of the second function uh, at the first point. Uh, you, you multiply them. So in exactly the same way, you can define the inner product on L2 of gamma. So L2 of gamma has, um, has inner product. Um, defined pretty much in exactly the same way, it's just uh, this sum will be infinite. Uh, when you have inner product, uh, inner product tells you when two vectors are orthogonal. So this describes orthogonality. Uh, this here, this describes orthogonality um, of vectors. You can, uh, so given two functions, you can say if they are orthogonal or not. So we define for two functions to be orthogonal if their inner product is zero. So f is orthogonal to f prime by definition uh, if the inner product of f and f prime f prime is zero. Since we have this notion of orthogonality, uh, we can define the notion of orthogonal projection onto a subspace. If Maybe before we do this, uh, let me make a remark. Instead of taking L2 of gamma, I can take several copies of it and take the direct sum. So uh, also uh, L2 of gamma to the power n. Uh, that is just the direct sum of L2 of gamma uh, where i goes from 1 to n. You take n copies of it. Uh, this is also a Hilbert space. Uh, how can we uh, view this as a Hilbert space? Uh, you know that this is the same as as L2 of of what? I want to realize this as L2 of something. Uh, this is uh, L2 of gamma is the set of all functions from gamma to uh, to the coefficients to um, the complex numbers. Uh, since we take several copies of them. Uh, so gamma, in other words, gamma is a basis for this Hilbert space. Uh, if we take several copies of it, it means that we have uh, several disjoint copies of the basis. Uh, it means that we take gamma and multiply it by what? Uh, we take uh, n 
disjoint copies of the bases. Uh, so let's multiply it by the set from, from 1 to n. Right. Uh, this is isomorphic. One can construct an explicit isomorphism between this direct sum and the, the Hilbert space on the set, gamma cross some finite set. And you see this gamma cross some finite set, we already saw this in the discussion. Uh, when we put the order on the set of edges of, of a graph, we assume that uh, we have a group action on some graph, free group action. Uh, then the orbits of that action uh, were copies of the group gamma. And uh, the set of orbits, the, uh, sorry, the set of all edges uh, was split into orbits. The, the set of orbits was the same, sorry, the set of all edges is the same as uh, gamma, the group, cross some finite set. Uh, this is uh, this is very similar to, to what we did, right? Except that uh, I'm doing it completely formally here. There are no complexes so far. Uh, it's just a group and we take several copies of this group. And then we span a Hilbert space on, uh, on this uh, uh, disjoint union of several copies of, of gamma. Uh, okay, it's a Hilbert space. Uh, now, uh, on this Hilbert space you can also define uh, just the structure exactly the same way. So you can think, uh, so what's an element of this? An element of this can be thought of as a function from this set to complex numbers. So think of f in L2 of gamma n. Um, then uh, the best way of thinking of this function is it's a function from from this set uh, to complex numbers such that uh, such that the L2 norm of this function is again less than infinity where L2 norm is defined similarly but now we take the sum not only over gamma but we take the sum over all elements of this domain so uh, maybe I can l let's write this so it's it's the same definition you take f of x squared, uh, but now x runs uh, runs uh, through this set. Uh, so this becomes a Hilbert space. So I will always identify this with L two gamma to the power n. It's the same thing. Oh, you're right. The same twice. Oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> Oops, yeah, gamma. Uh, I will always identify this. Yeah. By the way, don't we need a square root? Well, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah, okay, <laughs> sorry. Yeah, yeah, sure. Sorry. Yeah. Oops, missed. Uh, yeah, sure. To make it a norm, you need to take a square root. Uh, uh, I guess the point was that if it's less than infinity, that's all I care about. But. Uh, yeah, uh, for the norm you take the square root. Uh, uh, okay, since we have the inner product on this space, it gives a notion of uh, orthogonality. Given two elements in this space, we define uh, them to be orthogonal if uh, their inner product is zero. Uh, since we have this notion of orthogonality, uh, we can define the notion of projection to a subspace. Let V be a subspace of of L two gamma n. Uh, especially good subspace would be a closed one. Uh, so the notion, uh, this norm defines a topology uh, gives a topology uh, on L2 of gamma so this becomes, in other words a neighborhood would be a ball with respect to this norm so you say a function is small uh, if the norm of this function is less than a fixed number epsilon so one can consider balls of radius epsilon um, in this space. Uh, those generate a topology. 
since we have a topology, uh, we can talk about closed or open subsets in here. So uh, the interesting case is when this is not just a subspace, but it's a closed subspace. So if V is closed, um, it is a Hilbert subspace. Uh, subspace of of L2 of gamma. Yeah. Right. Subspace. And we are particularly, uh, particularly interested not just uh, in subspaces, but in subspaces which are invariant under the group action. So here the group, uh, group action comes in. Gamma acts um, on what? Gamma acts on gamma, on itself, by, uh, by lift multiplication. by left multiplication. This induces the action of gamma on gamma cross um, one n, uh, cross a finite set. Um, uh, how does it act? If you have a pair, uh, it's just uh, gamma acts just on the first coordinate. Uh, very similar to what we did before for orderings, right? Uh, uh, just by acting on the first coordinate, uh, it induces the gamma action. Uh, on the second coordinate, it acts trivially, so it doesn't move anything. Uh, but since we have a gamma action on this set, it induces a gamma action on this space as well, because this set is a basis for this. So gamma acts on L2 of uh, gamma cross 1n. Uh, but that's of course the same as this uh, this space here, right? So what it does, it permutes the basis. So given arbitrary uh, element of this, uh, you can. It's a general fact about uh, Hilbert spaces. You can decompose it as a sum of. Uh, it's a, like an infinite linear combination uh, of the elements in here um, of the. Yeah, maybe I should say what the standard basis is, right? Uh, what is the standard basis? You, you, you consider the delta function, delta of x, um, where x is an element in here. So pick an element x. Uh, what is delta sub x? The delta sub x of y is denoted to be 1 if y is equal to x and 0 otherwise, right? So um, the set of all the set of all delta sub x uh, is a basis, uh, a Hilbert basis of the Hilbert space of uh, L two gamma n. So pick any element in here, any element, any function uh, which is L two summable uh, can be represented as an infinite linear combination of these. Um, and what are the coefficients in this li infinite linear combinations? Uh, they are required to be L2 summable as well. So uh, again, I'm just stating it's a standard fact about Hilbert spaces. Any function can be decomposed uh, um, uh, with respect to the basis in such a way so that the sum of the coefficients, the sum of the squares of the absolute values of the coefficients is finite. Uh, once you decompose a function uh, in terms of the basis, and you know how the group acts on the basis, then uh, it tells you how the group should act on each uh, each element in this um, Hilbert space. I guess I'm I'm getting late here, uh, so uh, let me just say uh, quickly that uh, we are interested not just in uh, subspaces, and not just in Hilbert subspaces of this but in those subspaces which are invariant under the group, uh, under this group action. And those are called uh, Hilbert gamma modules. Uh, for they will arise naturally from graphs, say, or from, uh, from complexes. We will see this later on.
Hilbert subspace also means we have an infinite linear combination. Oh, so what is Hilbert subspace means? Uh, it, it just means that it's a subspace, which means it's closed under addition and multiplication by a constant, right? Finite addition. Uh, yeah, just usual as a vector subspace. Vector subspace. And then you say Hilbert uh, subspace if, in addition to that, it is closed. So if we so if we gamma invariant, we say if we Hilbert gamma. Yeah. One first defines what a Hilbert gamma module is, and then one can define what a Hilbert gamma submodule is. Yeah. Okay, so let's thank the speaker for the great hearing. <laughs>